Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And on this week's Roundtable podcast, we have almost all the usual suspects. We've got the Zen Master. Breathe in the mailing, breathe out the marketing. Mike Zeno. Mike, how are you? We're doing great. Thank you for asking. It's good to see you. We've got your partner in crime on Nightcap. Dude, buddy, the Nightcap OG, Scott Bossman. Scott, how are things in Onalaska? Uh, things are things are fine. Bracing for some freezing rain today, but uh, but glad to be here. Yeah, I mean, freezing rain this time of year is like spring. We've got yeah. the technician, Eric Peterson. Eric, how are you? Good, Mark. Happy to be here. Good to see you. And of course, Taria putting in the reps. Harris, Taria, how are things? Things are great. Thank you. Good to, good to see you. Now, your partner in crime is not here today, but we still have not come up with a good nickname. I think we might have to outsource it to the community. Is, is Landon going to be Surf and Turf? The land I like shark? Surf and Turf. I don't think you can beat Surf and Turf. Like That is the most uh, epic name ever. Uh, I love land that man. I, I think the community shark, needs, needs to weigh in. Land Shark. shark. Yeah, Baby shark. Good stuff going on last call. Land in shock. Da, do, do, do. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I love it when you call me Big Papa. Tate Litchfield. Tate, how are things in Vegas? It's good. Yeah. It's uh, cold. We're, we're cold. Just uh, running the heater. It's going to be a balmy, I think, 51 degrees out today. It's uh, time to head south. That's what it is. It oh. is. Yeah. You and I are on the same, like, just weather pattern where it's 51 yeah. here. It's the cold. correct weather pattern. The correct weather pattern. <laughs> and this time of year, when I see people in shorts and t-shirts, I just immediately look at them and say, I, I imagine Scott of- Bossman is one of those guys. Yeah. Like, like if he came to Vegas Wisconsin right now, Canada, are you from? Oh yeah. Yeah. He'd go to the pool. I guarantee if he was in Vegas, like you could see him at the pool later today. Yeah. Well, you know, and no last but not least, you know him. You love him. Your flights go Sherpa. Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmoto.com. Learn anything about anything, investorninjas.com. Scott Todd, how are you? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm great, but I'd be better if I saw Hamilton on Broadway. Listen, I, I'm in shorts today, by the way. Just saying. <laughs> What's the weather there, Scott? Uh, right this minute at 78 degrees. What? Yeah. Yeah. However, on Saturday it will be 59. So like whatever Mark and Tate have today will make its way over this way. But 59. 360. You just ripped. Oh. Seven, oh. 78. Wow. Yeah. That'd be the high 59. Yeah. So someone's got a commercial running in the background is, which I think is not the worst idea when Scott Todd is talking about nice weather like let's just yank that off right away not the worst idea so we've got a great topic before we get into our topic just a little reminder that today's podcast is sponsored by flight school learn how the next 16 weeks can literally transform your life go up that mountain quickly safely efficiently with scott todd as your sherpa who's done it thousands of times oh yeah that flight school tuition ain't gonna cost you nothing guaranteed you're gonna make it back 180 days or less, cash or terms deals. Just show us your work. Learn more, go to landgeek.com forward slash training, thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Okay, we got a great topic. Let's just say that there's a lot of fear out there and it's economic fear. There's inflation. There's unemployment fears. Eric Peterson loves crypto. There's FTX fears and crypto fears. They've people like Eric have lost 80% of their portfolio in crypto. <laughs> tech big tech is laying people off left and right. The future looks bleak. Let's talk about our own recession fears. And I think we can start with the Zen master, Mike Zeno. Because he loves going first. Yes, of course. Unless, um, you do, unless you want 
dude buddy to take this one first. Oh, I can pass the buck. I get like a one time pass the buck. No, never mind. Oh, no. Just about to catch I just, that. I just, I just want to tease you on that. No, right. What? What? What are your? What are your thoughts on recession? And do you feel? How do you think that your business will be affected by a recession? So, I mean, I hear a lot of talk about it, um, and you know, from different people you listen to, uh, whether it's on YouTube or online or the web or friends and the news, but. Um, so, but I don't know, I'm not an expert in whether or not we're really going to have some major recession, but I do feel in terms of the business, I feel actually really good about it. I feel like there's a lot of my word for the day will be discernment. Like we, we, we make wise choices on the buy side and we buy in our assets, 25 cents on the dollar and inherently, uh, protect ourselves from the potential, you know, fact that maybe there'll be something happen where the land gets devalued slightly or, or even if it got devalued dramatically, Mark, I mean, I think the worst case scenario is I would double my money and I'm still okay with that. I'm not a, we, we joke about the land snobs, right? Where it's like, oh, I didn't make 400%, you know, and I only doubled my money today. Well, you know what? I'd be fine with that. And, uh, and so I'm not, I'm not overly concerned. If somebody were to default, if I were to get maybe an increase in defaults, I, might, I would you know, I already have my cost basis reduced. So I would probably turn around and sell them for a smaller monthly payment and most likely, most definitely make more money in the long run. So I'm really, I'm feeling pretty good about it. Again, no expert here, but based upon uh, you know, the way that I buy and, and the, when I look at my portfolio currently, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good, Mark. I'm not going to lie. Okay. Fantastic. Is it fair to say that you wouldn't be bothered at all by a recession in the sense that if there were defaults, it would lower your cost basis and that when you're on the buy side, you'd be buying at a much yeah. cheaper price? I agree. I agree. Now, if I, if there were, you know, I could see if somebody were managing this whole thing themselves, I could see where there might be a little bit of anxiety because like, okay, I, not in the fact that you're going to lose money, but you have to then remarket, resell these properties. But if you have a properly built system, then um, you're not going to be stressing that. So I know I, I uh, we're talking about the, I mean, I guess I wouldn't, I don't want a recession to come. I think it could affect in other ways, but in terms of my business, I feel pretty good. Okay. Fair enough. Dude, buddy, nightcap OG, Scott Bossman. What are your thoughts about a recession, how it would affect your business? Scott, you're on mute. Sorry about that. There Sorry about that. Um, like my buddy, not an economist, but uh, I, I feel good about this business right now. I think, you know, I, I mentioned on a podcast in the past, like when you look at everything, you know, I've been doing this for seven years. When you look at everything over the past seven years, what has been the most stable thing that I have come across or heard about? Uh, and I would say that that is land. Uh, year after year, the business continues to grow. I feel like I'm protecting myself uh, in the land business because I like where I'm parking my money. Um, I'm not leaving it in the bank where my dollar is losing value. I'm, I'm investing in an asset at a deep discount that is only growing in value over time. And I am spreading that money out amongst many smaller assets. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of people new to the business, they may not know, you know, if you're hearing this podcast today for the first time and we're talking land investing, a lot of people are under the impression we're buying these really large value land parcels, $50,000, $70,000 or more. But really, we're parking our money in lower value assets and kind of diversifying our, our investments in that way. In a lot of land parcels, you know, less than $5,000. And I think that's a protection in this market to uh, kind of allocate your funds in that way across many, many assets instead of a few assets. Uh, and we're still, you know, still selling those, those parcels because I think we are, you know, able to sell them at an affordable, uh, monthly payment for a lot of people. I think that's a really good point. The diversification of the asset class where we look at it and we say, oh, we just buy and sell raw land, but it gets more micro than that. We buy, sell raw land in various parts of the country. And those various markets are going to be affected maybe even vastly differently than other parts of the country would. So I could only imagine 
if I were in, say, multifamily, I had one building. Well, all my eggs are in that one building basket in that one you know, city or you know, part of the country. So the diversification isn't necessarily there. That's a really good point. I have a feeling that the technician, Eric Peterson, will have his own points about recession. Eric, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I certainly agree with with uh, what Mike and Scott have already said, but but I also think um, maybe to elaborate on that a little bit more, um, our business model uh, basically we're out there trying to sell these properties on terms, and it's not just one property; it's many properties, it's hundreds of properties that we're putting on contracts, right? And we're collecting monthly payments over time. So the reality is, if we come into a recession, are all those people going to default? Are they all going to struggle to the same degree? Probably not, right? So yeah, we can lose some, but to Mike's point, you know, we've recouped recouped capital by that point. So now we can maybe sell at a lower price. Maybe we can extend the term and sell at a lower price and still make the same kind of money that we were looking to get originally for that property. Um, The other thing is like these properties that that we offer to the market, they're extremely affordable. You know, we talk about a car payment and less, right? So oftentimes these properties are a hundred dollars a month. Okay. Um, If times get hard, can we sell those properties for $50 a month and extend the term? We probably could, right? If we had to, um, it might take longer for us to recoup capital on a, on a property that hasn't been sold in that scenario. But um, if we're creating cash flow, that's much more important than just sitting on that asset, even if it's half the cash flow that we would have expected. Okay. And then on the buy side, I think that, uh, you know, there's great potential for amazing opportunities, right? If, if we've got cash to buy or we've got ways to raise cash to buy, um, if we really do hit a bad recession or even a depression, like the, all that land out there, it's going to be on sale. Like we're going to buy this even better than we're buying it now for better prices, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, the unknown is, is a little bit scary, but I think that if you sit down and you, you kind of think through this business model and and what you're building, um, I think it can kind of put your mind at ease a little bit. I like to say that there's a lot of security in what we do because we're so diversified in our streams of income. It's not one person paying us X dollars a month. It's, it's many, many people paying us X dollars a month. So if a couple of those go wrong, we've still got a steady stream of income. Absolutely. We have a huge buyer pool because it's affordable. And it's not only are we diversified asset wise, we're diversified with our customer. So in investment banking, we'd always be looking at these companies and we said, what's our customer concentration? And if, a company's biggest customer was 80% of their revenue and they lost that customer and 80% of the revenue went away, that company wasn't valuable. They had a massive customer concentration issue. And that's a really great point we don't talk about enough as well. So I think that's a, a, a really good point. And then just to put the the nail on it to really bring the point home. The fact that you said that we're in the business of ending financial insecurity, that's what the passive income provides us. We could flip and flip all day long, but then we're constantly insecure because in an ever-changing economy, we don't know where our next deal is coming from. We don't know what our cost basis is going to be. We don't know what we can sell it for. And we may have adapted our lifestyle to an older economic environment. 
where let's say I was buying for 30, I was flipping for 60. I was, it was a great market. I did that 12 times. I made $360,000 that year. And now the next year, oh, wait, it might be half that. But I've adapted now to making that kind of income where we can look at our passive income and really much more easily budget out how we want to live. If we want cash, we can sell notes. It's just, there's just no financial insecurity at all. Not to say that there would never be financial insecurity. I mean, look, who knows? I mean, we, there's you can always think of some doomsday scenario, but besides some type of black swan event, you really are in a much better position with monthly passive income than you are not knowing where your next deal is coming from. But Taria Harris, putting in the reps, Taria Harris, might disagree. Taria, what are your thoughts about recession and how it could affect your business? So this is a conversation that Landon and I had a lot uh, this year because he retired this year. And so this would be our first year with his income being provided from the business. And so we did think about scenarios where if the economy, you know, took a dip, how would that affect us? How would that not necessarily the business as a whole, because we know the business will continue to move, but how would that affect us financially being that the business is paying him? And so for us, although we were confident that the business would definitely survive, obviously, as all the things everyone has mentioned, we're diversified, we're not putting all of our eggs in one basket, being one potential buyer spread out over many, many, many buyers. Uh, but for us, it was important to not over leverage the company, like making sure that we budget it well so that in the event that, let's say, 50% of our notes go away, that we could still maintain like our standard of living or, or what we need in order for our household to run. So I think for us, it was never a fact of, well, the business would die. No, it would continue to move forward. But it was important for us to understand our finances and how to budget them properly so that if the business does happen to take a decrease, that it wouldn't adversely affect us. I love it. I love it. Look, the 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 family that budgets their passive income together stays together. <laughs> it's it's great. We'll make shirts. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I love it when you call me Big Papa Tate Litchfield. I think we've all hit on the major points. So I love having you and Scott go last for that added pressure of what more can I add to this conversation. It's a good, uh, you know, I echo what everybody else says. And I believe, you know, one of the things we kind of alluded to is lifestyle creep, right? And and passive income really prevents lifestyle creep in a way, because you're not getting those big windfalls. And so do I want a recession? No. Do I want half my notes to default? No. Do I think that's going to happen? Well, I've asked my magic eight ball and he said, absolutely not. So I'm feeling confident in this, but you know, what, what do I know? Right. But I do trust my eight ball. It's never led me astray, but look, I mean, there is uncertainty all around us, right. And everything that we do, as far as what we're doing, we're staying the course, right. What happens happens. Uh, you get your business to a point where eventually you're going to see defaults every single week. And that's okay too, because it means you've grown. It means you've scaled to that uh, that level where you just have a healthy turnover within your organization, and that's okay. But um, you know, I I don't want anything bad to happen to anyone. I certainly don't want that to happen to the economy or people to get laid off or financial hard strips. But the one thing that I have focused on heavily with my family is avoiding that lifestyle creep, right? And we do that by living within our means, and that kind of is one of our ethos within land geek right it's enough is enough there is a point where you are going to make enough money and maybe that's hey i want to spend more time with the kids and less time doing work and maybe the way that you're spending that time is at the park which is a free or low-cost activity that's valuable right so i uh i'm grateful for that i'm grateful for you know mark is my mentor for kind of instilling that into me at a very early age of like hey you're going to have great months and you're going to have good months and some months are going to be okay, but 
live consistently and, and what comes will come and you're not going to stress over that. So I, I'm thankful, I guess. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And I think for all the listeners who've read Dirt Rich or have listened to me talk about my story, I've made the mistakes so you don't have to. I had Parkinson's law of money where all the money that it came in, I would spend on all these things that I thought would make me happy. And sure enough, it actually was the reverse. It created insecurity. It there, there was never enough. And so until you feel inside that you're enough, it will never be enough. In fact, I had Jason Campbell on uh, last week on the podcast and he was, we were talking about the one-eyed land king and the one-eyed land king would look at the land and say, well, how much land do you want? And he said more. And it was never enough. He could never get enough land. And there is that point where spiritually speaking, you play the game as well as you can play the game, but you need to know your enough number so that at some point you can live with that just internal feeling of knowing it's an abundant world. I have enough. That being said, I like to play the game. I want to, I want to reach goals. I want to strive because it's fun, not because it makes me look a certain way to other people or then I'm going to feel like I, you know, achieve some arbitrary goal that maybe my parents had set for me, whatever it is. The hustle's still alive. The hustle's hustle's definitely still still alive. No, for sure the hustle's still alive. Because it's fun. We need adversity. I mean, let's pick on Scott Todd. He solved his money problems. He solved his time problems. Well, I mean, we could pick on everyone on the roundtable. Everyone on this roundtable solved their money problems and solved their time problems. Maybe not necessarily Trish still has a job. Mike still has his job. But let's not dwell on those two that keep their job because they want to keep their job, not because they have to. Once that's done, once your money problems, your time problems are, are solved, what what do you want to do with your life? And we're all giving back. We're all serving other people. It's not like we go and to pick on Scott Todd, he just wants to travel around the world on his airplane and play golf at at all these exotic golf locations. He could do that, but I don't think it would be fun for him. I think the joy of going through obstacles, having adversity in your life is fun. And you just grow personally, you grow professionally. And it's like a video game. It's fun to get to that next level. It's hard, but it's fun. And as long as you're having that approach to it, you're not taking it personally when you get knocked down a level. Well, okay, I just got knocked down a level, but I have all these skills that I learned from all these other levels. I can get back up to that next level fairly quickly. It's just fun, but your identity is not tied to it. And whether you get up to the highest level that society says you can get up to and you're an Elon Musk, or you're at the lowest level that society says, and you're living, you know, deal to deal that really shouldn't affect you. Once you have that enough number, I shouldn't say deal to deal. You don't want to live like that, but better than that. You want to move up once you're at over above Maslow's hierarchy of needs into having your, the, the basics solved for, which if you're listening to this podcast, I guarantee you have your basics off for. Then it's just fun. Scott Todd, I can't believe you didn't interrupt me on that diatribe there. Just gonna let you go, man. Just let you go. That's kind of you. That's kind of you. At some point, I gotta get that hand signal. We got the point, Mark. It's my turn to talk about recession. I mean, what is there left to say? It's all been said. I got the easiest job there is today. Just They said it. What do I have to do? I think there's a point to be made that hasn't been made. And do you want me to serve it up to you? Uh, You could. Okay, let's go for it. Go. All right. I'm going to say the word debt. 
okay, all right. Yeah, that's a good point. All right. So, you know, the, the reality is, is that um, one, we buy these properties with cash, right? Like we, 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 we pay for them in full. So you don't have the bank, the bank financing behind it. And as a result of that, you're not going to have to worry about when the bank loan is going to come crashing in on you or when you're not going to be able to refinance the note. So, you know, I think that that's, um, that, that's a key thing here is that, I mean, the, the fact that the banks don't, look, the banks are what have created this, um, this opportunity. Why have they created it? It's because they don't want to loan for it. So they, they make the market inefficient. And as a result of that, we get to step in and, and act as the role of the bank. Well, the fact that the bank doesn't want to loan loan us money on our land, the same the same you know blessing that we make money on is is also another blessing when it comes to recessions because we don't have to worry about all those all those components that like the bank's going to call your loan or you know a lot of times commercial real estate's uh, sold with a balloon a balloon mortgage. I mean, can you can you imagine? I mean, think about this in for a second. Let, let's just say that you bought. Let's just say that you're, I don't know, Grant Cardone, maybe. I, I mean, you know, and you know, you buy these these apartments at uh, like a five cap. Okay, five cap. What does that mean? It means you're paying basically you're making five percent on your money. Now all of a sudden you go to refinance the property, and because the balloon comes due this year, and like you know, what what interest rate are you going to get? Eight percent. Wow. That's no good. I mean, you have to either raise your rent ridiculous amounts. If the cut costs like crazy, it's kind of hard to do that on an apartment building too. It puts you into a, a, a debt spiral, not not a situation that I want to be in. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, I, I'm I'm happy with the fact that the land is owned free and clear, and I don't, that's one less problem I have to worry about. There you go. So to reiterate. All the advantages of our model. We've got diversification in asset area and diversification of customer as well. So we're not relying on a few customers. We could have hundreds of notes. We don't have to worry. We're actually, when there is a downturn, we're making our money on the buy. So if we get a default, our cost basis is lower. And to Mike's point, we just market it at a different price point that the market wants. So again, we're not stuck with an asset just sitting in inventory that won't be producing. We'll get that note producing again, that cash flow. To Eric's point, we don't have financial insecurity. We're not thinking to ourselves, where's our next deal coming from? Because we have the passive income already created. To Taria's point, it's very simple to budget out your lifestyle and not have, as Tate would say, lifestyle creep, forecasting out your passive income. Again, reiterating the point, you have financial security. And then the fact that no matter what happens in the economy, they raise interest rates, they lower interest rates, we don't have debt saddling us down. In fact, I can tell you in 2008, when a lot of my land friends had to go get jobs because they had over leveraged themselves in raw land, I was just fine. Now, certainly I had other issues that I had to deal with as far as lowering my personal overhead, but Frontier Properties as a company was profitable as it had ever been because we, I had already bought at the right price. I was buying these assets, 25, 30 cents a dollar to Mike Zander's point. What's the worst case? I double my money. Double my money is the worst case. So we are in the right business, no matter what happens to the economy. And congratulations for being, <laughs> being in it. Because if you're listening to this and you're feeling some stress, it's going to be the stress that you're feeling in your in the land business. It's going to be the eight ball stress because of it's just we don't know what's going to happen in the future. But you know, there's one thing I do know that's going to happen in the future that is inevitable. There's two things that in life that are inevitable: death 
in taxes. But let's talk about death, my favorite subject. The baby boomers are inevitably going to die like all of us, dear listener. And that huge wealth transfer is coming whether we like it or not. And those people inheriting that wealth are going to be spending that money for themselves, for their heirs, and they are most likely going to want an asset that lasts forever. And it's the generational asset and especially one that they can easily afford. So now is a great time to be an entrepreneur and have opportunity that historically speaking comes around once in a lifetime. We're just born at the right time. We don't talk about that enough, but luckily I'm obsessed with death and I think about it all the time. So we are now at the point on that lovely note where we get to ask Taria Harris for her tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something else actionable where the artifacts of Instagram listeners can go and improve their businesses, improve their lives. Taria, I hope it's life affirming. What do you got? <laughs> yeah, so... This may be a bit controversial, um, especially for the group of people on this call, but um, I was told about a show with uh, Chris Hemsworth called Limitless. And so basically the show is him just exploring different ways that you can live better and longer. His idea is taking on different physical challenges, altering his you know, eating habits and patterns, um, which may or may not work for some people. And I'm not saying, definitely not a doctor, not recommending anyone go out and do what he's saying. But my tip of the week is for all of us, especially those of us who are getting a little older, to consider alternative methods in order to increase our longevity. Mark has his way of imagining to die every day. And that seems to help him. I go to the gym every day. We all have something that we do. So my tip of the week is you don't have to grow old while you're young. You can help prevent some things from happening that would normally happen if you just take time to explore other options for your health. That's my Okay. I, I love that. I want to go around and just hear what everybody is. Oh, dear God. Is. Mike, what's your longevity tip that you're currently using? It can't just be a tip. You actually be incorporating it in your life. Uh, daily cold plunge. I'm up here in New England, and uh, every morning I go out, kick through the ice, and I sit in there for three minutes. Daily cold plunge. I love it. I do it as well. Scott Bossman. You're on mute, Bossman. Yeah, Scott. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I still do the intermittent fasting about three to four days a week. I don't do it every day. And I'm um, working out three to four days a week. Those, those are my things. Those are great. Eric Peterson. He's wearing his Peloton. He's got his <laughs> Peloton sweatshirt on. He's like, I got the I tonal. It, I got the Peloton. Right. It's like, where do I start? It's just working out. That's that's my thing. Six days a week. Um, I'm on the Peloton or on the tonal or doing something else. Are you Are you constantly sore? No. Okay. That's good. Uh, Taria, besides working out, anything else? Um, I, I have to. I intermittent fast. I mean, just kind of not necessarily every day, but definitely Monday through Friday. And for the new year, anything interesting diet-wise? Yeah, we go on a 21-day fast at the beginning of every year. Just reset, refocus. So 21 days starting, I think, on the second. Yeah, so go ahead and, and, and put into the Mighty Networks group and the Facebook group your encouragement for Tria and Landon on this 21-day <laughs> fast. And if you wanted to go do it with them, I think I'm I'm thinking about it. Zeno and I are... are She's going to add about vegetables. We're, I'm in. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do like it's called a Daniel's fast. You'll you'll love it. I can only do 19 days though, because Laura's birthday is on the 19th. So we have to go out to eat. So it's a 19 day. Fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. Tate. Uh, you know, I think the best things you can do for your body is get some uh get some fresh air, some sun every day, uh, exercise and eat healthy. There you go. 
He didn't Scott mention Todd? that he runs and hikes and bikes. I know. <laughs> That was a very humble answer, but yes. Uh, yeah, it's very humble. Like, we, would all, we all want Tate's resting heart rate of like 30 beats per minute. <laughs> Scott Todd, what about you? Uh, let's see. Oh, watch your daily calorie intake. Simple. Okay. Eat on a, on a regular rhythm. Okay. So eat, eat multiple times a day, every three hours a day until you go to sleep. And then you wake up and you start the process over again. And I like what Tate said, get out, go for a walk, you know, go, go do something outside, ride a bike, keep moving, move your feet. I love it. So and, oh, by I, the way, do some squats, yeah. do some squats, do squats. It's the most squats. important of all the exercises, squats. Why? Because if you don't do your squats, when you get old, you can't stand up. Okay. Well, I'm glad you said that. So this is what I've been doing. So six days a week. I wake up, I do my breath work for seven minutes. I meditate for 30 stop, minutes. Stop, stop, stop. This is my Hold turn. On. Lamaze? Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> yes, yes, he does Lamaze. I mean, Mark, I don't do Lamaze. In, in all Lamaze. fairness, in all fairness. Mark, they don't know just, what I'm talking about. Listen, it's in all fairness. It's funny. Buddy's can funny. You just, can you just give all of the listeners a taste no, of I what your leave. daily... Hey, hey, this is this is one for the record right here, brother. If I can get him to do it, Mark, you got to give them a sample of what this is. I'm not saying to play it. I want them to hear it. And then, by the way, if you don't do it, I have a video I can share with everybody. I won't do it, though. The Wim, the Wim Hof video? Not as Wim your Hof. friend. As oh, your friend. The, oh, the video. The, uh, as yeah. your friend. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I know that Scott has got you like dangling out there. You, you, you barely pass on a challenge, but this might be one to pass on, my friend. This might be one to pass on. Can I just finish my little protocol? I'm very proud of it. After yeah. I meditate, I do at least 100 push-ups. Now, I've worked up to 44 straight now. Now, That's I want to be able to get to 100 I can do straight. But I've wor- I'm slowly working up to it. But then I get to over 100 to failure. And then I go do the cold plunge. I do the infrared sauna. I do the hot tub. And I take a walk. I get out in nature. So I try to do that every day. But to Scott Todd's point, I take Sunday off and I don't do the push-ups. I do at least 100 squats. And then I'm sore for the whole week doing the squats. Pretty good. Not to mention some other things that are very controversial that I probably shouldn't mention. But that's my protocol. I thought this was a great podcast. It was. It was a little long for us normally, but pretty good. I want to thank the listeners, remind them the only way that we're going to be able to have Scott Todd not show a video of me doing breath work is if you do three favors, follow, rate, review the podcast, send us a screenshot of that review, support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send it to you for free, a signed copy of Dirt Rich. And that, I think, right now on the Ethereum exchanges is worth 0.02 Ethereum. I don't know. It's gone down. But do it anyways, it helps. So one, two, three, let's let, let freedom, freedom, freedom bring. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Are you ready to learn how you can start building a passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents? Schedule a free consultation at thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Let freedom ring.